Okay, good morning everybody. It is early, uh, nine o'clock, this is really early for me as well. I'm very glad that you're here, I'm very glad that I'm here actually. Uh, you are here in the class Analytical Sociology. So I reckon that most of you are in your second year. Who's not in your second year? Everybody in the second year. And um, this class, um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you, first of all, an idea about uh, what you have to do. So how this class is structured, um, how do the requirements look like, how will the exam look like. And then after that, I give you an overview of all the things that we're going to do in this term. And on Thursday, which is when our next lecture is, we're going to start with the substantive parts. Right? Okay. So one of the things that um, always frustrated me, you know, with uh, with courses when I when I was a, a student, you know, not too long ago, it was um, when these lectures were fuzzy and it was a lot of gray zones and it wasn't really clear what I had to do to um, get a good grade in the exam, right, to pass this thing at the end of the day. So. I think a course, especially at the undergraduate level, should be structured in such a way and it should be so clear and so straightforward that at the end, every one of you, if you do what I tell you, if you do the readings, if you come to the lectures, if you study hard, if you are reasonably intelligent, which is what all of you are, you will do great in the exam. So having that in mind, I designed this course with a very open agenda, uh, very transparent, very straightforwardly, so that you should know what you have to do at the end of the day. So what are the rules for this course? Well, the first one is showing up. Right? You are here. Great. Well, actually, there are much more people registered for the course than some people that showed up. But um, this is the first step. When you look at it, at the university, we do reward showing up quite a lot. In fact, for many uh, courses, as long as you show up, you're going to pass the exam somehow. Right? You can vomit the exam, but when you show up, uh, you will still be fine. So why do we do that? Well, because we think the world works like that. The world rewards showing up. When you have a job, you need to show up. When you want to achieve something, you need to show up. If you want to get rid of those water charges, you need to show up at a protest march. Things are not just going to happen. Second thing, pay attention. Well, I think that's a no-brainer, but let me mention it anyway. Well, university life, you're now in your second year, so you have one year already after behind you. University life works differently than school. One of the things that I noticed when I was an undergraduate, it was just the sheer speed of how things go. It's much faster paced at the university than in school. Here I talk about stuff for 45 minutes and you're supposed to know it, and a while before you would have talked about it for weeks or months and then there would have been an exam and whatnot. University life is much faster. Well, why is that? Well, because we think this is, uh, you are at a stage in your life where you, are, where you are supposed to learn how to pick things up and teach yourself. Well, it's not my job to tell you everything in the world. You'll forget about this stuff. But I'm very happy when I manage to teach you to think in certain ways so that you are able to teach yourself in the future. So this is sort of the stuff that sticks with you. So please pay attention for this, but I think it's going to be much easier with the smaller numbers here. Well, the third one. You will notice that this course is really based. There will be a lot of readings. And I will ask you to do one reading for every lecture. And I want you to do these readings before. So you will show up, you will have read something, and we will elaborate on this more 
appear in the lecture. Why do we have that? Again, you know, it's so much simpler at some point to teach yourself, or you need to learn, you need to get the skills, you need to find ways to develop yourself forward, to get into the things that interest you. At some point, you're going to be the expert in your field. So do the readings, and I come back to that in a second. Okay. Well, I think the way we teach at the university is changing. Actually, it's changing tremendously. There's like this big wave hitting the universities, and a lot of people have no idea what to do with it. The world is changing. You guys, you are on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, whatever you do, it's tremendously changing our life. Universities are affected by this in many ways. And now they are these massive online courses, you know, where you can take some amazing courses for some amazing dudes together with 100,000 other people. Right? At the university, often we have difficulties dealing with that, or we don't really know how to handle it. Well, I decided to attack this at full speed. That means two things. Well, first of all, I'm recording this session. So I'm recording all the lectures, and I will make them available to you in Blackboard afterwards. Given that the technical stuff all works out. Right? Apparently, I'm one of the first guys who tries to do that. So um, let's see. Secondly, I want to set this up in an interactive way. So I don't want to have this being a one-way road, right? But in fact, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. And you cannot hide. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was originally thinking about doing this with technology. and. Uh, well, we will still do that because we will do some experiments, so we will still run that. So the way this works is take out your phones, take out your tablets, your electrical tools, brothers, whatever you use to go to the internet, to update your Facebook, to update your Instagram, go to this website. Type in the code. Code for today is 894117. This looks excellent. Yesterday I was teaching some first years and they had no idea. Yeah. Okay, well that's excellent, that's perfect because Blackboard is going to be an essential part of this lecture as well. Right? So you will see a very detailed syllabus there and I'm going to use it to post material. There is already a lot of material on there. There's going to be the assignments, other sorts of procedures and so on. Right? Okay, but most of you know what Blackboard is, which is great. If you still happen to have a problem, contact the IT people. They're happy to help you. Okay, so what will you find? When you go to Blackboard, well, first of all, you see some module information. And this is sort of a detailed outline where I describe a whole bunch of the practicalities of this course. Right? How... Um, what the assignment look like, when is the exam going to be, um, but generally what are the rules for this thing. Yeah? So I highly recommend that you go there, print this thing out, and look at it. You will also see a detailed syllabus. 
but I come back to that in a second. Okay. So this course has four components. First, readings. You will have to read. And why do we do that? Because you're progressing towards that stage, right? You're not first years anymore. You're in your second year. You're done with the textbooks. Now actually you're moving ahead to the real stuff, to the cool stuff. Then there's going to be the lectures. You know, I will be talking about some stuff. You will have one assignment. It's due at the beginning of March, but I'll come back to that in a second. And there's going to be an end of term exam. Okay, let's talk about these readings. Well, first of all, let me show you the syllabus. So that's the thing that you can, you will find in the module information. You know, a little description about stuff, you know, some details about how you can reach me, for example. Um, if you have any administrative problems, contact our undergraduate administrators. And there you see required and further readings. And then we go further on. Let's talk about that. Here you see our detailed game plan. And so that's kind of the, the outline for this, for this term. You see the topics that we're going to cover. And you'll also see readings to these topics. There's always going to be one reading that is the required reading. Uh, so that's, for example, that's for example the reading for Thursday. That's the stuff that I want you to read. The other stuff, this is really if you want to get more into this, if you are very excited about this, or if you want to, I don't know, start thinking about a bachelor thesis in one of these areas, right? So, but it's not required to do the other readings. So always the one with the star at the front of it. So that's sort of for next week. You know, that's sort of a short little reading. And there's another one for next week, Thursday. It's going to be this one here, right? So these readings, they are important. You know, at the end of the day, the exam will be about these readings. If you haven't read the stuff, you will not do well in the exam. Um, when you do the readings, uh, the, you will do very well in the exam. However, I also selected them in a way that they are very interesting. I found them, these are my favorite articles, so I put them up there. I'm very excited about this stuff. And I think they are also easy to read. Some of them, there might be only a few, uh, there might be some confusing statistics or some things you have never heard about it. I want you to read through it, take as much out of it as possible, don't get back down, just try to digest the main message. So that's something you learn as you, as you progress at university as well, how to read. And one of the key things is to not get frustrated. Yeah? To, to read through it, pick up as much as you can. Don't think that you're stupid. Sometimes it takes a second read. Sometimes the text is just stupid, it's not you. And um, so don't get um, uh, frustrated by this. I put all these readings on Blackboard. So that's the stuff that you can already find. So you have the syllables and module information and the readings. Um, you know, the separate category. I split it up for the different weeks. And when you click into this thing, you know, there's a folder and uh, there you see the quiet readings and the further readings and there you see uh, the PDFs so all this kind of stuff, right? So for Thursday, there's one reading in this required readings folder. Okay, let's talk about the lectures. Well, they take place Tuesday and Thursday, 9 to 9.45. Bloody early, not my choice. Yeah. I'm here with you. Um, Clinton Theatre, Tuesday, and N Arts on Thursday. I assume you all know where these places are. It's going to be the Easter break, yeah? so we're going to be affected by this. There are going to be no lectures during that period. 
And there's also going to be no lecture on the 14th of April. But I will give you a warning before that as well. That's the Thursday I will tell you again on the Tuesday. Okay, let me talk about the assignments, or more precisely about the assignment. There will be one assignment, it will be posted in Blackboard on the 24th of February, and then you essentially have two weeks time to complete the assignment. Submission will be through Blackboard, you know, there's a submission form, whatever, uh, I have a slide for that in a second. Procedure for this assignment, you know, there will be detailed instructions about what you are supposed to do. Complete the assignment, write your name and student number on it, and submit it through Blackboard. Similar like showing up, if you submit it late, you will lose points. That's just something we have to do at the School of Sociology. Again, in Blackboard, there's this category assessment. When you click on that, you find all sorts of other things. And there is also um, something about how to upload your assignment. And there's also the um, form that you have to click to upload stuff. I don't have to tell you that these things are going to be checked for plagiarism automatically and things like that. So um, you know, just, just, just don't do it. It's bad anyway. Okay, the fourth component of this course is going to be an exam, end of term exam for two hours. It takes place at some point in May. Uh, the exact date is not, not known yet, nobody knows. And you will need in depth knowledge of the readings for the exam. So, without doing the readings, you might pass the exam but you will definitely not do well in the exam. So do the readings. The exam will count for 80% of your total grade, and the assignment will be the other 20%. And in the assignment, um, I will be looking for you know, three things. Essentially, it's going to check up to that point that you've done the readings. Uh, it will check that you can transfer the knowledge from the readings, apply it in another context, and it will also check uh, that you can make a coherent argument, yeah? that you can write a little bit. The assignment, I'm not entirely sure yet what it's going to be, but most likely it's going to be a small little essay, not too long, where I want you to reflect on some of the readings. Okay, do you guys have any questions? Everything clear? That's great. That's great. Well, I was about to say check the module information in Blackboard, right? So that's always useful. Um, I also set up a discussion board. Uh, I don't know if that's the way you, if you want to use that. Go ahead. You know, um, it's one of the possibilities in Blackboard that I was keen to try out. But um, I leave that up to you. If you do have some questions, you know, you have peers around you. Uh, actually, um, I always think that's where you learn the most. You learn the most from the people around you and the people that go with you through this. Um, if you have an administrative question, ask our undergraduate administrator, Deirdre. She's very nice. Um, she knows all these things. In fact, I don't know anything. You know, I'm pretty new to this university, so this is my first term here. So you are here much longer than I am. So you know this university much better. I'm still puzzled by how things go, and I have no idea. So if you want to get a correct answer, go to Deirdre. If you want to go have a wrong answer, you can come to me. Lastly, you can contact me for any other issues or something you're uncomfortable with posting in the, um, in the forum. You know, you have my email details. I also have office hours. You can find that out in the School of Sociology website. 
Okay, well, you guys don't have any questions. I had another thing here, so, but we can, we can have that. Or are there any other questions? Right? There are no stupid questions. Okay. So, analytical sociology. Um, has anybody of you ever heard of analytical sociology? Hands up. Who has heard about analytical sociology before? Who has not heard about analytical sociology before? Hands up. Okay, this is all brand new for you stuff, <laughs> uh, for you guys. That's, uh, that's exciting. Um, analytical sociology, sometimes we also call it explanatory sociology, or I think analytical sociology is taking it even one step further. Uh, analytical sociology is actually a brand new thing. So this stuff is maybe I don't know, seven, eight years old, which in academic terms is really new. Yeah. I remember, um, and was it eight years back when I started my PhD? Back in Oxford, I was around these people, you know, these famous dudes, and they're sitting there, and there were 10 of us sitting in the, in the room, and this is where analytical sociology started, actually. So this was sort of a small little meeting. Yeah. And then it progressed, and uh, now we have a huge international community. We have conferences with 300 people attending these kind of things. So it is sort of um, pretty cutting edge, and uh, people got very excited about it, mostly because people were very frustrated, including me, how people did sociology before. Right? So a lot of sociology, and we'll cover that in the readings as well, a lot of sociology, I don't know about what your opinion is, but I don't know about the courses that you attended. You know, I don't even know my colleagues yet that well. But a lot of sociologists, they do a lot of mumbo jumbo. Yeah. They do a lot of bull crap. Yeah. So I listen to it and I wonder, what the hell is this all about? Yeah. So analytical sociology tries to take another route. Analytical sociology says, simple is beautiful. Clear is beautiful. Straightforward. There is no reason to say something in a complicated, fancy way just because you want to sound academic or you want to be pretentious. So analytical sociology is the opposite of that. Then analytical sociology or explanatory sociology, it tries to explain things. It's not just describing things or interpreting things about what we think it really tries to get to the core of why do the social phenomena happen that we do observe. And it actually even requires you to think out of the box in terms of the large and the smaller scales. So we have big societal phenomena that happen. I'll give you an example, and we'll talk about that. Segregation. Right? The American context was a big thing. Right? Segregated parts. Nowadays we have it... Uh, uh, poor neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods, we have racial differences, we have um, educational differences. Society is incredibly segregated. Analytical sociology tries to understand how can that be? Not what do people feel about it or how much is it, but how did it come about? It's really about the generative processes that lead to the social phenomena that we observe. In that sense, you know, for me, this is very, um, it's very stimulating. It's very pleasing. Yeah? It provides, it tries to give us an answer. Instead of thinking, oh, we could think about it in this way or that way, or that's what these people think, or that's what some others feel. So it's much more to the point. It tries to explain things, and it tries to explain things how they come about. So I was mentioning it is about thinking. So what I hope that you will take out of this class is not only that you get excited about analytical sociology and all the wonders and all the amazing things you can do in this field, but also that you start to think in a different way, that you look at the social world around you in a different way. And part of it is to separate the social phenomena from the individuals that act in them and think about the interaction patterns that play a role for the social phenomena to come about. Because often we have, and you will see that later on, we can get vastly different 
vastly different outcomes at the macro level from very small little differences in the individual level. A lot of sociologists don't see that. They think they need to say, oh, they think in this country there's more unemployment, or in this country there's something else, or in this country there's a difference, so there must be something big different. There must be a big difference in this. But analytical sociology looks at this in a different perspective because it looks at the dynamics at how things come about. And one nice example is I was uh, curious where you guys walk in. Right? So nobody wants to sit in the front row. Right? That's always how it goes. Actually, we will have a reading about this. And let's say we have this rule, or let's say may maybe this is the thing. Maybe nobody wants to sit in the front row. Or maybe you just want to sit behind somebody. Right? So if you want to sit behind somebody, then we have this pattern unfolding where at some point all of you sit at the back and nobody is sitting at the front, right? And when you go to international conferences or where else, you know, there's always the thing that happens. Or the other funny thing is people often sit at the, at the side, right? And then you always have these really weird things and then everybody needs to stand up uh, while in fact when others walk in, while in fact it could have been so much easier if people just would have walked into, into the center in the first instance, right? But there individually, you know, everybody wants to sit out there and collectively to arrive at a pattern that we might not want at all. So actually that's going to be one of the major issues as well about social dilemma and tragedies and, and whatnot. It is about being clear, right? It's about explaining things, but it's also about the dynamics that unfold. You know, when we want to explain something, and we buy into the idea that individuals don't act in a social vacu vacuum, right? which makes a lot of sense. We are sociologists. We think society matters. right? Society is all around us. But yet, when you look at how sociologists, or a lot of sociologists, do sociology, they look at the individuals as if they were isolated. When we look at how most of the statistical analysis are done, 90% of the time, or even more, we assume that our observations are, are, are independent from each other, which is ridiculous when you think about it. You are embedded in a social environment. You are embedded within a context. You walked into this theater here. You looked at where are the other people sitting. Nobody is sitting at the front. Oh, I don't want to walk to the front. Maybe you were a little more adventurous. You walked a little more to the front, but you didn't go into the front seat either. Right? So, you are definitely surrounded by society. Society matters a great deal, and it matters even at a very small scale. So, and when we buy into this argument, which I think makes a lot of sense, that uh, the things around you matter for what you're going to do, hang on a moment. That means when I do something, this changes the world for somebody else which then might lead to this person behaving in a different way, which then might change the world for somebody else again, which then might change for this person seeing the world in a different way, and so on and so on and so forth. Right? So that means we can have these cascades, we can have these dynamics that unfold up to points where we end up in a segregated world, where we end up in an unequal world, while in fact the original differences were tiny while in fact nobody actually wanted to end up in that world. So I will show you that we can demonstrate that we end up in a highly segregated world even when everybody wants to live in an integrated world. And that stuff for me is fascinating. Yeah? In fact, this reinvigorated my belief in the social sciences and sociology. So I was doing this classical sociological things like social mobility studies, social stratification and so on, you know, at this place where people used to do these things for ages and they are known for their social mobility studies and whatnot, right? Actually, I, was, I think I was still doing something interesting because I was looking at food and drinking behavior, yeah? and I was looking at how this differs with social class, but I was incredibly frustrated by using something, something huge something as a sledgehammer like social class and hitting it on people's eating preferences. Right? So it felt like completely, what, what the hell am I doing here? Right? I get a bigger picture, yes, and this is important, that's interesting, but I thought I'm missing out on so many other things. Right? 
I'm missing out on the, on the dynamics that unfold that lead to the pattern that we actually observe. And I think this is the part where sociology can actually make a contribution. Nobody else does that. Yeah. Psychologists, they are great at looking at the micro level. You know, they know why, I don't know, your brain works in a certain way, which uh, leads to certain neurons being fired and whatnot, and then at some point you're having emotions and doing whatnot. They are good in this, right? Others are good at describing uh, what we observe at the society level, right? We can describe that. Um, what is the unemployment rate? Um, what is the suicide rate? Um, uh, how segregated is the world? These kind of things. But I think the real contribution of sociology is in linking these two things. Linking these things, thinking about how individuals act, thinking about how individuals are dependent on each other, how they change each other's worlds, and how this actually leads to a broader macro level social phenomenon. To give you an example, we'll come back to that. You all heard about Max Weber's Protestant ethic. Who has heard about Max Weber's Protestant ethic? Yeah, some guys, others don't. Uh, well, one of those kind of, you know, Max Weber, one of the founding fathers of sociology, uh, the guy, he, um, um, well, he did a lot of interesting things, but one of the things he looked at, the relationship between Protestantism and capitalism. Right? So he realized, well, the, the, the countries where capitalism first came about, you know, England, the United States, <laughs> or the Netherlands, they were predominantly Protestants. So he made this link between these two things, right? And that's a macro level link that he established. But how does something like Protestantism lead to capitalism? Is there a greater being? Is there something, you know, a collective mind or whatnot? Does society exist? You know, and these are sort of the kind of questions that people had for a long time, and the puzzles that they were working with. And then some guys, you know, like, like Emil Durkheim, he says, okay, there is an entity at the, at the higher level. It does exist, right, and it's there. But um, I don't believe in that. I think ultimately society is comprised of individuals. It's individuals who behave. It's individuals who act. There is no greater being out there. Right? It's you guys doing something. You guys, you might have certain ideas about others. You guys might have certain ideas about the society, which ultimately affects your behavior, which then leads to you behaving in a certain way, which might lead up again to changing the world for others and how they experience society around them. Right? But I think it's individuals who behave. Who else is there? Individuals are the actors. And that's sort of one of the core things in, sociology, in, in analytical sociology. It doesn't mean that other things don't matter, you know, like culture or institutions or things like that. They're still there, but they don't do anything by themselves. And I think that's something one can agree with. So coming back to the Protestant ethic. So then there's a guy, James Coleman, we'll talk about him during the course as well. He put this in another context. He said, okay, well, we have the Protestant, we have Protestantism on the one side. What does it do? It leads to individuals experiencing Protestantism around them. Right? There's the idea of uh, predisposition and kind of it leads to individuals having certain ideas that how they need to behave to reach heaven or how, whether they've been, been chosen, whether they've been called and, uh, and so on but it leads to individual's experiences, right? Which then makes individuals behave in a certain way. So they behave in, a, 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 in an ascetic way, right? So they are kind of good, good scholars, you know, I don't know, they sort of, they, they uh, try to multiply their wealth and things like that, you know, because if they do that, it shows that they have been chosen by God. Yeah? That's sort of the, the idea in a very nutshell, right? in this way this comes from in the idea of Protestantism. Then let's say everybody behaves like that. Right? Everybody's striving right, to, 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 to honor uh, uh, their, their, their faith and uh, everybody is 
behaving in a very ascetic way. You know, they don't waste money. They are they are they don't overspend. They kind of try to maximize their profit and things like that. If everybody behaves like that, then we end up with capitalism at the end. Right? So that's sort of, in a nutshell, one of those what is called the micro-macro link, or it's also referred as Coleman's boat, because you're going from the macro level to the micro level, from the micro level to the micro level, from the micro to the, to the macro level again. Right? So this is sort of the way you then think about how things at the macro level um, um, come about. But it gets even more interesting, because when you go up or when you go down on this level, it's not that straightforward. It's not that the whole is just the sum of the parts often we know that is exactly not the case. The whole is oftentimes more than the sum of its parts. Or sometimes it's less. Yeah? Sometimes everybody wants to do good and collectively we do the worst thing we, we could imagine. Right? So that's where it becomes interesting to bridge these levels, to go from the micro to the macro again, where things aggregate and it's not just the addition of the individual elements. Similarly, when you go down from the macro to the micro level, and we'll talk about this at some point during the course, I don't know when it's set up, but some of my, uh, my own research, uh, I'm fascinated by this, how we experience our world through our social networks. Which is undoubtedly true, right? You, you experience, you interact with your, uh, with your fellow students, uh, with your family, with your friends, you know, these are sort of the people that you interact with. That's kind of the stuff that you hear about or what's happening. When you look at your social networks, they are incredibly biased. They are incredibly structured. Just think about it for a moment. Think about the age of your friends. How many people do you know who are 95 years old? And with how many of them do you regularly go out and have drinks? Right? Or with how many people do you hang out who are just in kindergarten? Think about another dimension. Think about education. Think about your friends. Think about um, the education that they have. Well, in my world, all of my friends, they have a fucking PhD. It's a driving license. We all have it. It's nothing, no biggie. Yeah? But we all know each other. We got to know each other at university, we went through this together, and here we are. So now all of our networks are incredibly biased. So that the things that we experience through these networks are incredibly biased. And it becomes fascinating to explain some of these things, like, I don't know, I don't know if some of you are from the States, but um, there you sometimes wonder, how can it be that any reasonable, intelligent person could even think about voting for the Republic? Or probably other people think, how could it be that any reasonably intelligent people could think about voting for the Democrats? Right? So we have polarization. If we have more polarization than ever, and for each individual, in their own environment, in their own social context, it's a no-brainer. It's not a biggie. Yeah? The reason for that is because the environments are incredibly structured. They are incredibly biased. So coming back to my own research, where I looked at how social networks affect how we experience our world, you know, I was dwelling on this thing, which is fascinating, and we'll talk about that. But, um, and I love to tell this to people, especially when there are some old dudes, established professors and whatnot. You know, I tell them in their face, you know, your friends have more friends than you do. Right? Or in fact, your friends also look better than you on average. You know, that's another sort of thing that I have to add. I wonder how can that be? My friends on average have more friends than I have, but it's pure logic. It's pure logic because those guys who have many friends, they show up in many friendship relationships, right? So they are seen by more people. So somebody who has just five friends is only seen by five other people. So only five other people will see this guy who has only five friends. While somebody who has a lot of friends will be seen by a lot of people. It's one of those things why we also, for example, under overestimate how busy it is when, when we go shopping. Right? Because chances are that you go to, uh, to the city center when there are lots of people. 
when there are only a few people, there are only a few people to tell others that there were only a few people. So it's one of those things where I'm like, what the hell? How is this going? Right? But it sort of emphasizes how we need to think about individuals' perceptions of their social environment. How this and actually, if you think and you play it through, right, it's sort of whatever your, um, your experience, let's say, it's um, very busy in town or there's not busy in town or I want to go shopping or I don't want to go shopping, yeah, you will act on what you experience in your world. And our brain is incredibly bad in dealing with probabilities or in dealing with, uh, uh, dealing with these things. Our brain is incredibly good in dealing with experiences. But we are very bad with, with uh, dealing with things that we don't experience. I'll give you another example. One thing that, that I've been thinking for a while and actually I'm working on something about this right now is um, that um, we only experience the things that actually happen. Right? Think, okay, of course, yeah. But that means we don't experience the things that don't happen. Right? And that's kind of really hard for us to grasp. So, I don't know, maybe to ask you one question in that context. I don't know how many people here are, maybe 30 people, maybe 40 people, and so on, right? What do you think is the probability that two of you guys have birthday on the same day? have a quick quote on this. So do you think it's less than 5% hands up? Okay, less than 10% hands up. Less than 20% hands up. Less than 30% hands up. Okay, more than 40% hands up. Actually, I haven't calculated it yet, but as soon as there are 23 people in this room, I would bet my money on it. As soon as there are 23 people, the chance is more than 50%. So when we have maybe 30 or 40 people or so on, I reckon we are around maybe 70% or something like that. So there's a really high chance, right? But you already noticed, what, how can that be? Well, because you only, you think about your birthday, you don't think about all the, all the combinations of people that there are in this room, and you don't think about the events that do not have to happen. Just have to be one combination of here, and it can be any of those days. So we always remember one particular day, but it could have been any other day as well. Right? So the same thing, and we're going to talk about this at some point as well, is we all have these experiences. You walk, some, you walk into somewhere and you meet your best friend from high school. Right? Or um, you, know, you are at the other end of the world and then you run into a colleague. And you wonder, how ridiculous is that? Huh? That's kind of crazy. How can it be that I meet this guy here? Right? And you think, oh, this is fate. Uh, it brought us together and whatnot. Yeah. No, it's pure chance. Pure chance. And the thing is, you don't remember the things that don't happen. You don't think about the events that... You don't think about the people that you could have met and that you didn't meet. You only remember the guys that you do meet. You don't remember the days when nothing happens in your life. Right? Some days are just incredibly boring. There's just nothing happening. Yeah. But you do remember the ones where something exciting happens. So that's sort of one of those things, just to give you an idea about our brain is not that good in understanding these things. And we need to distinguish between how the world actually looks like, and that's actually what we're going to talk about uh, next week, uh, about how the world actually looks like, and how from an individual point of view, how things look like. And that there are these differences, and that we need to be very explicit about these differences. Okay, we'll talk a lot about networks. I mentioned this already. Actually, this is my field of study, so I do lots of network analysis. And uh, in particular, here's a brief outline of the wonders that we are going to cover during this lecture. At the beginning, uh, we'll talk about clarity, you know, this precision, this straightforwardness that I talked about. Mm. After that, for next week, there's one reading by Thomas Schelling. Right? It's a Nobel Prize winner. He's an incredibly cool guy. And he writes beautifully and very simple as well. And we'll talk about solar dynamics and one of those phenomena, you know, where you are in a traffic jam and uh, you sit there in your car, you stop, right? And then it takes on very slow, painfully slow. And at some point, after half an hour, an hour, you're through the traffic jam. And then you wonder, 
There's nothing. There's no accident. There's no, uh, there's no construction site. There's just nothing. Well, I'm sure you experience these kind of things, but how could, how could that have been, right? Well, we'll talk about these kind of things that um, one mechanism, rational imitation, which could actually lead to these kind of things. You know, I drive slow and suddenly the guy in front of me breaks for whatever reason. You know, maybe he just uh, was nervous. Maybe he just accidentally stepped on the brake. I don't know that this guy stepped on the brake accidentally. Yeah? Maybe I think the guy sees something that I don't see. And I step onto the brake. Then the person behind me sees that not only is the person two cars in front of him stepping at the brake, but I'm stepping on the brake as well. Like, oh, there, there's probably something happening there. Right? Let's hit the brake. And then somebody else does the same thing. And at some point you end up in a traffic jam. And then at some point it sort of vanishes. And it's like this mystery, what the hell happened here? Right? But we ended up in a scenario because of the social dynamics that underlie it. And when we take this further, we end up in these scenarios. I talked about this already before. Sometimes we call this emergence, that the whole is not just the sum of its parts. Actually, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Right? Sometimes it's also less than the sum of the parts. So think about the tragedy of the comets. Right? We all have an incentive, or we all um, benefit from letting our cattle graze on some, some farm. You know, that's sort of where the tragedy of the commons comes from. But collectively, we do really bad. So all of us would be better, or climate change, all of us would be better if we are very strict about, uh, about uh, controlling our emissions and so on. But, uh, um, uh, but collectively, we don't achieve that because of the incentive structure that we have. The distinction between micro and macro. We'll actually talk about this cow, exactly this cow up there. Right? And we'll talk about uh, what is known as the wisdom of the crowd, which is this phenomenon that groups. Let's see how we, how we can spin it with 40 people here. But as soon as you increase the numbers, people are incredibly good, incredibly good at hitting the weight of this cow. Right? You know, think about you know, quiz shows, you know, where you can, can call the, ask the audience or something like that. Yeah? They are incredibly good. How do, they, how do they go about this, right? So that's one of these phenomena, and they are actually, you're going to see that actually we would do worse if we would all be experts. Right? Or actually, it would be worse if we start talking about the weight of the cow, if we start discussing it. Right? So these are sort of the conditions about how the crowd or the collective can be incredibly intelligent, right? even though individuals, of course not you, are incredibly stupid. Anyway, we talk about social inference. So in that context, we'll talk about um, cultural um, uh, social inference in the cultural domain. Uh, there were these experiments, and there's one uh, reading that you'll have to do on this an experiment about, uh, you know, where they had sort of a top list of they had sort of this fake Spotify thingy. They set it up you know, before it all became popular. Uh, and they studied it there, and they had these fake charts, right? And then they had people rank about how much they liked stuff. And then actually, you know, it led to this, to these, to these uh, reinforcing dynamics, where sort of, you know, they, they just flipped the ranking completely around as an experiment. And then they saw actually people vote very differently. Right? If you would think that people are not influenced by others, you would say, well, it shouldn't matter. Right? There's always sort of the good song and there's the bad song and so on. But there, it actually mattered a great deal, huge differences. So songs that were completely at the ranked at the bottom were suddenly completely ranked at the top because people thought that others ranked them high. In a similar way, we would talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. Well, a self-fulfilling prophecy, you might have heard about this. Right? It's sort of this thing where a bank can go bust if everybody thinks that the bank is bust even though the bank hasn't been passed before. Right? So it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. People think there is no money at the bank anymore. They run to the bank, they take out their money, and then the bank actually goes bust. So if we would all do this, if we would all decide, now collectively, everybody in Ireland, we just take off our money from the bank, they would all be bust. Right? So self-fulfilling prophecy is how things can come true that were not true before, so they fulfill themselves. We'll talk about success breeds success dynamics, or what's called the Matthew effect. Yeah. Like those who have shall be given. You know, how, and that actually leads to, to, how, um, to an understanding of how inequalities can, can, can multiply and kind of uh, reinforce themselves. 
We'll talk about tipping and sort of how small little changes can lead to big differences, why we still maintain cultural diversity, how segregation comes about, the dynamics associated with it, and throughout this whole thing we'll talk about networks a lot as well. Okay, so that's sort of a brief outline. For Thursday, you have one reading to do. Now, this is paper by Sokal. Uh, you find it in Blackboard under the reading sections, week one required readings, right? Okay, that's from me. Do you guys have any other questions? Then see you on Thursday in the Newman Building. Lecture theater and nine o'clock.